Hi everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Recruiting Funnel Deconstructed. My name is Claire Alloway, and I am on the marketing team here at JobVite. So before we get started, I just wanted to go over a couple of details. Um, first off, so obviously we would love to have your questions and everything for the webinar, but if you are a big Twitterer, um, tweeter, I think is the actual word, you can use the hashtag JVChat, and we have some people on to answer any questions, to encourage discussion there. So we'd love to have your tweets there. Um, and then for overall webinar tips, everyone is muted right now to avoid background noise, but like I said, please use the chat box and the left side of the ReadyTalk panel, and we'll be moderating that. Um, throughout the presentation. The Q&A will actually be at the end of the presentation, though. Uh, so to get started, I wanted to introduce one of our speakers, Chris Foreman. He is the founder and CEO of AppCast. He has 20 years of experience in building recruiting technology through a series of different companies listed there. He's spoken at 200 plus industry events and conferences, and he's part of the team that won the HR Tech Product of the Year on three different occasions. Hi, Claire. Hi, everybody. Hi, Chris. So to introduce AppCast, uh, AppCast is a pay per applicant job ads platform. It is, it, you only sponsor jobs that need applicants. It's a pay-per-applicant, not a pay-per-click posting, a uh, pay-per-click or posting. There are 60 million job seekers from 6,000 sites through their network. There's proven candidate quality, uh, and you can attract active and passive candidates. With, and the AppCast uses no fees or a long-term contract, so it's easy to jump in. Also, I wanted to show you just a quick look at the many customers that AppCast has using their platform. I won't list them all, um, but definitely some great names there. Moving on to Rachel Betty, who is the Chief People Officer here at JobVite. She has over 18 years of experience in HR leadership and a career predominantly in the tech industry with a focus on change leadership and talent management. She started her career as a recruiter at Apple and Intuit. And a little thing about JobVite. JobVite is the modern recruiting platform. And as you can see, this is uh, all of our available products from JobVite brand, which can help you build a mobile optimized career site and, and improve your employment branding. JobVite refer and engage, helping you bring in those employee referrals and engage as a sourcing CRM. JobVite Video is our on-demand video interviewing tool, and JobVite Hire is our applicant tracking system. Throughout that entire platform, we also have mobile capabilities, an incredible analytics and reporting platform. Everything is on the cloud and a great list of integrations to help plug in to your HRIS and obviously your job boards and companies like our great partner, AppCast. Just like AppCast, we have a really wonderful list of customers that we like to promote. Uh, some of their names are here. So with that, uh, summing up all of, our, all of our promotional material, I want to pass it over to Rachel to start the presentation. Thank you, Claire. Uh, welcome, everybody. Chris and I are definitely thrilled to have you with us today, and we are particularly thrilled about um, the number of folks that have joined to talk about this topic um, with the recruiting funnel. So first and foremost, just wanted to talk a little bit about kind of the context, which I think many of you are feeling on a daily basis, but it's great to be able to have some numbers as we think about what's going on in the industry. Uh, the Bureau of Labor talks about the statistics of what we call the STEM workforce, uh, which depending upon your industry, um, there's the science folks, the technology folks, the engineering, the mathematics folks, which often we refer to as kind of data talent, um, that workforce has got 8.65 million workers by 2018. So, but at the same time, it's hugely competitive. Uh, as if any of you are working on any of those requisitions and looking for that talent, you know how competitive that space can very much be. So the other thing, next thing we wanted to share with you uh, was around, you know, the, the job seekers have actually changed as well. Uh, research is continuing to show that the millennial workers are going to change jobs every three to four years. 
Um, and this isn't like staggering new information. I know things changed between my parents' generation and even my generation, and then of course my generation and then my millennials that I have on the team. So that has caused a, you've got a supply and demand challenge that's happening in the industry. You also have more frequency of talent that will be moving uh, around in companies or even between companies, of course, and so that, of course, continues to create more demand for folks. So we'll start to top into the, uh, the funnel. The actual recruiting funnel uh, really needs to continue to change um, for companies, and this is about being competitive uh, in your space and recruiting the best talent and really looking at what we kind of call the health, efficiency, and the performance of your funnel. Um, it gives you a great perspective to be able to identify, you know, where are things going really well for you and your company? Where, does, where could things really be improved? Um, and depending upon where you're at in that funnel, you know, making a significant change at that top of that funnel could have enormous rewards towards the bottom of that funnel for you. Uh, the other thing that's also really important is many of you probably are managing budgets as it relates to talent recruitment um, and your recruiters, right? You're balancing people and technology and tools and resources and partnerships like an AppCast, for example, really looking at the cost of all of your work in each stage of the funnel and really figuring out what are the benefits that you're getting at each of those stages to make improvements. Uh, we're going to step next into, you know, I guess I alluded a little bit to this, right? You've got, there's processes you can do. Um, I love being able to identify a leak, right? You may have a spot that's just really like leaking out a, a large percentage of either qualified candidates or just candidates in general. Um, and then you may find something based upon your company and your industry that is just really great wins for you. And being able to know what those are so you can continue to double down uh, and that will make, will, can really, really help. So understanding all those stages of your funnel, really understanding from top to bottom is a critical component. So we're gonna dive into the first one, uh, which we talk about employment branding. Um, this is definitely, the, the field has shifted, I'm sure as many of you have felt, that it's no longer the company can completely controlling with regards to the employment branding. Um, it has become a much more of an employee's contributing, right? And candidates contributing to some of your brand given the social networking that's out there. And so I think of it as our job in the space of the work we do is how do we help enable? Um, we have particular objectives about our brand that we want to have out there, but we don't fully control all of it. And so how do you enable your, your employees in particular to um, you know, continue that brand and to be able to speak for it and represent for you as well. One of the interesting statistics um, that this has come from a, a LinkedIn uh, talent pulse report that they did this last year was that 56% of employment branding was the number one factor uh, when candidates were considering a new job. Um, interestingly enough, it you know surpassed things like product and actually you know culture or people or even like a prestigious awards or reputations actually that branding and what is known about you and your company actually is very, very prevalent. So, um, Some of you may remember Princess Bride. I will admit it is one of my favorite movies. In fact, my, uh, my husband's um, log for me on the phone is actually a quote from this. So, <laughs> um, tells you probably how old I am, where I fit in this world. But uh, yeah, Princess Bride, we remember stories, right? People really remember experiences and stories, and every company has this. Um, I think part of what's important is how do you really identify which ones are yours? Uh, what makes it really powerful for your employees that makes them want to be there and makes them want to be part of the organization? And no matter, no matter kind of how big or small you are, um, there's a chance to really build a transparent career side, for example, that really brings that to life. Um, there's lots of things around the voice of the employee, whether it's anecdotal stories or surveys and data that really shows what's, what's your employee's perspective. Um, and then, of course, really being able to look at your social media and really being able to leverage those, those areas as well. Um, if, you, if any of you are kind of really wanting to double down in this area, I definitely recommend you look at uh, Richard Mosley's book around employment branding. Like He was one of the forefronts that really talked a lot about what does it mean to do this. Um, so if you're interested in delving any more to that, that's a great resource to think about. We'd love to share with you, um, we have a customer called Tenable that um, is actually made, uh, based out of Maryland area. And they're about a 500 employee security industry company for us. Um, and just to share with you, this last year, they really took their social networking to another level. Um, and they did every, it was very much around leveraging their employees and their social networking um, opportunities and making it really easy for the employees to go tweet something, for example. They actually did a campaign around March Madness. 
uh, that was really, really worked well for them. And you can see the results here that within the first 24 hours, they had over 700 actual career site visits, which was just, you know, they're 500 employees. Like, they had more than their actual employees, you know, come to their site. Um, and then, of course, you know, that increased their career site visit, which was huge, from really just about 3,600 a month to almost over 40,000 a month in their area. So talk about really impactful, talk about opening up that top of the funnel in a way that they had never done before um, can be really powerful when you think about the, the rest of the funnel. The other thing we really talk about is that using that social media, um, many companies that have done this, they've actually found a 49% improvement in their actual quality of their candidates as well versus some of their traditional um, channels. And so that's really interesting as well. It's not just about a quantity game. There's actually a quality that comes into play in thinking about um, recruiting and sourcing from, from the social perspective. So speaking of sourcing, that's kind of another big part of the funnel that's pretty important for us um, when we think about it. So let's go to the next slide if we could. Thank you. Uh, you know, let's look at the top of this, right? We talk about having passive candidates and applications kind of in that top part. And this um, data comes from our job bite data, which of course has all of our you know, thousands of customers information for you know, quite some time. This is actually based upon nearly 50 million job seekers and over 10 million actual applications. So this is data that touches lots of industries, lots of locations in the country. And what they find is that 24% of passive candidates actually become an actual applicant. So right there, there's a big chunk that kind of drops off. And so really being able to think about this um, from that perspective. When we, when we talk about um, you know, the part of the funnel, we talk about tracking your applicants as candidates. Um, and many of us all know CRM, right, from being able to, from a marketing and sales funnel. The recruiting funnel is really not that different. Um, it is about the performance at each of those stages. It's about what are you doing in the ROI and return on that. And so we really talk about it, the uh, candidate uh, relationship management system, right? So really being able to track all of that and understand where you know, you, the, the original source is, but also what's happening with them throughout that funnel. Um, as we've talked about earlier, you know, there's just going to be continued movement in jobs given the generation, but there's also just continued demand for talent as companies are trying to be competitive for talent that really kind of forces us to be a great match. Uh, the other anecdotal I would add in here is that, you know, my boss is a CEO and many of my leaders that I've had, they're very savvy about sales and marketing funnels. And so they really are looking to HR to say, hey, help explain this to me as well. And so they're very um, willing and wanting to understand this in the data perspective. And so you as an HR leader being able to articulate this in your own funnel um, is just a great way to, to speak a common language as you think about the performance of your organization in recruiting. So. Oh, the wonderful active versus passive recruiting, right? Um, you know, there is a very big part of active that is still very prevalent and very much works for folks. I still think that the largest sources of applications are still coming. Job boards is like 43% and career sites is 34%. And we're going to show you a slide later that goes into even more detail, but that's still really prevalent. That's, that's very active for that. And so very large sources of applications that come into that area. Um, on the passive side, you know, of course, referrals have continued to be one of the most important ones. Also, past candidates. Um, we actually hired somebody about three weeks ago into a role here at JobVite that did not get the role in another role about a quarter before. But we're like, huh, now that we have this other role, wait a minute, what about so-and-so? And so it really is an opportunity to always keep those other past candidates in the mix for future opportunities. And then, of course, social media ends up being a really particularly tied with your brand. Uh, can be really powerful as well. I think a Glassdoor survey showed that nearly 94% of respondents are likely to apply to a job if the employer actually actively manages that brand a bit. Um, and so there is a role that we can be playing um, as an HR organization with our, with our candidates and thinking about that. So with that, one of the most important things we think about is, you know, we talk about active and passive candidates, is there's a much more um, kind of strategic part of sourcing that's really critical. Um, and I'm thrilled to have Chris uh, co, co leading this with me today, and so I'm going to ask him to start to step us through the sourcing stuff. Sure. Thanks so much, Rachel. Uh, good afternoon or good morning, everybody. Um, you know, one of the things that, that Rachel's talked about up to this point, impact that brand has on, you know, kind of preparing the battle space for um, and talent for, um, you know, your recruiting activities. Employer brands can 
predispose passive candidates, a strong employer rank can predispose passive candidates to transition to being active. It allows you to, you know, theoretically, you know, get the best active candidates to be attracted to your organization. But, you know, brand, you know, fundamentally prepares the battle space. You then need to kind of start to, you know, move into, rather than brand marketing, direct response marketing. And so this is the type of stuff that, you know, there are teams at Amazon or at Etsy or, you know, any e-commerce platform that focuses on taking people that have intent, want to buy this toaster or this set of shoes or, you know, these airplane tickets, and helping them convert from that intent to a customer. Exactly the same thing happens in recruiting. And so, you know, there's a, a, a couple of, you know, key standard operating procedures or best practices that everybody, if they're serious about optimizing their recruiting funnel and removing those leaks, should be focused on. The first one is, you know, taking a look at all the sources of candidates that you have, you know, kind of coming through your, uh, your, your career site and measuring the return on investment that you get from each one of them. And, you know, this is, you can get tools that, 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 that do this and, and print out pretty reports, or it can be as simple as, you know, a pivot table or an Excel spreadsheet that you do every single month. But it's the discipline of doing so. And, you know, fundamentally, you can see a, a picture here. The idea is, saying, all right, how much traffic are we getting from Source X? How many applies are we getting from Source X? How much did we spend in aggregate at Source X? What is that translating to in terms of a cost per application? And then most importantly, you know, what is the cost per quality applicant? And everyone defines the QCPA differently. Um, you know, most of them uh, revolve around making it to the hiring manager's desk or, you know, let's say surviving the recruiter's phone screen or pre-screen. However you do it, actually matters less. You just need to have a standard that you use across all of your sources. And what you're going to find, you know, and this is surprising to a lot of people, is the amount of variability that you have by source. And, you know, a lot of times preconceived notions about what is a good source or a bad source, of, you know, specifically for paid recruitment media, um, goes out the window when you actually look at the numbers. You can find a, 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 a media provider that is pumping through a huge amount of volume. So, you, you know, you may be only spending 4 or $5 per application, but none of them get to the hiring manager's desk. And while there may be another source that, you know, costs a fair amount to generate an applicant, but almost every one of them gets to the hiring manager's desk. And so, you know, having the discipline to measure, you know, that, that – that, you know, that simple performance is kind of a, a key KPI in direct response marketing uh, and specifically in, in recruitment marketing. And, you know, the, the next thing that I think is, is important is for everybody to understand the impact of their apply process and their platform on the conversion that they get from, you know, interested job seeker to applicant. So at AppCast, we've done a large longitudinal study that, you know, it's been going on for, oh gosh, two years now, about 750,000 job applications across, you know, 16 industries, um, all the major applicant tracking systems. And what you see in this slide is you can see that there's a huge difference between a best-in-class platform in terms of conversion rates, average and, and the low end. And so what you're seeing is two columns. The CTA column is, is a measurement that's called the click to apply rate, which means what percentage of, of clicks um, actually end up applying. So at the high end, the yellow and, and, and uh, Claire and Rachel are not paying because that's job by. Okay? So what this is telling you is that on average, uh, across all the job by clients that, that, we've, that we measure, roughly 7.5% of people that click on a job end up applying. Down at the tail end of, uh, of, the, uh, uh, of the chart, you see a, a, a dedicated healthcare ATS. Um, and this is a really onerous platform. It's very difficult to apply to. And you see you know, almost a three times reduction between you know, best in class and, and uh, lowest in class performance. 
Now, the reason why this is important is not only are you, you know, do you attract, you know, theoretically high quality candidates um, when you have a, a more difficult applicant tracking process to go through. The other part of it is more and more of recruitment media is, is transitioning to pay for performance advertising. The most, you know, kind of popular version of which is cost per click advertising. That's that's the Indeed model. And so, in the cost per click environment, you pay for every click that somebody, you know. Uh, you know, has on one of your job apps. So in this world, what's interesting is is that a, an application process that has a high form friction, meaning that very few people kind of get through the process, it ends up dramatically increasing the cost of, of your applicants. You have to have a lot more clicks to get one person to apply. And so that's what the second column says, is that it actually shows you based on uh, an industry average cost per click what an applicant would cost, purely based on the applicant tracking system that you can be a huge variety. So this is this is kind of a, a a fairly big deal that I don't think a lot of people pay attention to, which then you know kind of leads into um, the the candidate experience. Um, you know, so much of direct response marketing has to do with getting people to go through a process. And that online process, you know, is you know, very akin to an e-commerce transaction. And the better that is, the more effective you're going to be at getting the candidates. So um, again, we talked about you know the percentage of of you know passive candidates that you know transition to applicants. And here, you know, the the, the next bit of data, and this is this is job light data, shows that 12% of applicants in general lead to an interview. And you know, so you're starting to see how this funnel starts to really tighten down. So Rachel, I think you've got a few comments that you want to make on this slide and the next one, yes? Yeah, one of the things that we've often talked about is that you know, this is about your candidate experience. And yes, you're predominantly focusing on those folks being candidates for your jobs and be part of the company. But many of you probably also are consumer-facing brands and companies too. And so being able to think about your candidates could also be your prospective customers or partners for your business. And so really having them, whether they get hired or don't get hired, how do they have a really good experience through that entire process? Um, and they become you know, advocates for your company regardless of whether they're hired or could become customers for your products. Um, I know at Intuit, you know, we have TurboTax, right? Everybody does taxes. And so we thought of every candidate could be a TurboTax customer too. So just kind of a side note on the customer experience to think about or the candidate experience to think about. Absolutely. All right. So um, Rachel, I think this is some of uh, why it's important. Oh. Um, this is some of your data. Yeah, absolutely. So um, thank you for that. One of the things we talk about, you know, why is it important? Um, yes, I kind of gave the overarching, right, your candidates could also be your customers. Um, but also really, you know, ignoring your customer's online presence could really hurt your brand more than you may realize it. Um, and some of the data that we've been able to find and really take a look at says, you know, 41% of job seekers believe employees are the most credible source of information. Um, I can imagine all of us have applied for jobs or we've had people ping us and say, hey, I see you work there, or can you tell me more about what it's like to be there? Um, I know I very much did that joining Job Byte three months ago. Um, I definitely you know, picked up the phone and, and connected with people who actually were employees or previous employees, um, and or of course people who are actually users of the product. And so there's just a credibility that comes from that source, and so leverage that in the work that you're doing. The other interesting statistic is that 75% of job, work, job seekers say that employee ratings and reviews are also influential uh, with where they work. Um, for us, definitely in the Bay Area here, you know, being able to see what's going on, Glassdoor, of course, is a resource, LinkedIn. There's tons of resources where um, that will actually influence a little bit. It maybe gives you a, a bit of a theme um, from an overarching perspective of what this company is great um, about and what are they maybe wanting to work on to see if it's a match for you. People are really looking for matches. And so you want to make sure that you don't ignore that presence that's out there online and that brand that you may have out there and how do you want to adjust it accordingly. So. Um, I think it's a great, great thing to just kind of note um, as you think about your business and your brand and how you're thinking about that. So, so Chris, I'm going to hand it off to you. And the next one has some great candidate experience, which comes from a lot of the AppCast um, great data and information. Yeah, it's it's exactly right. And these things go hand in hand. Brand 
you know, kind of predisposes people um, to an organization, and it has huge impacts about whether or not they throw their hat in the ring. There's also, you know, really, you know, kind of interesting granular data about how we as, as consumers, job seekers, and individuals react to how information is presented to us. So, you know, there, there, there are people in this world that's, that, you know, run hundreds and thousands of, of A-B tests every year to try and determine the optimal color, shape, and font of a buy button in e-commerce. And, you know, this, the, the, the delta between an orange button and a blue button may only be half a percent, but if you're doing $10 billion worth of, of, uh, <clears throat> of transactions every year, you know, half a percent is a little bit of money. Same type of thing happens in, in job search. So here's, again, some data that looks at the average click-to-apply rate. So that was the statistic that we talked about earlier. So a click-to-apply rate that is higher means that you have more people applying per click um, than if you had a lower number. And what you can see is on the left-hand side, uh, there is you know, kind of a Goldilocks um, size for your job descriptions. And so we measured the number of characters in a job description. So a character is a single letter or a space. So we combine those two things together. And when you start, what, you, what you see is, is that you know, really around 4,000 characters, you get the top of, of the curve. If it's too short, the, the click to apply rates truly drop off. And if it's too long, it drops off at well, as well. And you know, again, anecdotally, or if you think about this, this makes a lot of sense. You know, if there's not enough information, you're not going to take the time to apply. If there's too much information, it actually you're not going to read it. And so, you know, again, the porridge needs to be, you know, not too hot, not too cold. Though the data on uh, is is very similar on the job title side. It's a, it's a little bit muddier, but you can see again, the job title needs to be you know the right size, communicate the right type of information for somebody to kind of take the next step to explore her. Now. Um, Claire, we, uh, I think that we are going to, uh, you may have to provide some tech support here, but the thing that mm -hmm. we're going to do now is this is uh, 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 user interaction time. We're going to do a quick survey here. I would like everyone to tell me how long their online application process is. I hope that everybody here has uh, been, uh, you know, on a regular basis goes through and, you know, kind of applies uh, to your own jobs to understand what the candidate experience is like um, so that you can you know, walk a mile in their shoes. Um, but we're going to give people here a few minutes to do this. I can see the answers coming in, and, and this is going to be really, really interesting. So, um, so if you can just take a moment and uh, tell us um, how long it takes for a job seeker to complete your online application. We're about All at right. the halfway mark, everyone. I'll close it whenever you'd like, Chris. All right, we'll get to 100, and then I'll, I'll, I'll flip it on over, and we'll let people come on Perfect. in. We're almost there. We need four more responses. Three more. This is kind of like listening to National Public Radio. You know, if you get enough <laughs> of your, uh, uh, your fundraising in, we'll get back to regular programming. Okay, so now what we're going to do is we're going to skip to the results. So what you see here is and it, I think it's going to keep clear. It's going to keep on painting. But it's a third, a third, and a third. So about a third of the folks listening have an application that takes less than five minutes. About a third, it's you know, between six to ten minutes. About a third or over a little. Now, um, what I'm about to share with you is some research that, again, came from that same big longitudinal research study that we, we've been running up here at AppCast for a long time that looks at you know, what impacts um, form the, the application funnel. So we're not talking about a broader recruiting funnel. We're just trying to characterize what impacts somebody who has interest in one of your jobs on their ability to apply, what causes them to abandon um, that process. And so, um, again, I think that it, the, the data is holding pretty steady here, so I'm going to clip off of this. But take a look at this. And this is, this is not small data set data. This is big data set data. What we found was that the time it takes to complete an application 
it directly impacts the complete. So if an application takes less than five minutes to complete, roughly 12.5% of people that you know, click on a job end up applying. If it takes more than 15 minutes, it drops to 3.6%, roughly 385% less of a complete rate. Now, again, using that, that cost per click environment you know, and that, that mythical 50 cents per click you know, advertising cost, if you flip to the other side of this chart, this is you know, truly remarkable. Um, the, 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 these should be dollar signs. I'm sorry, I screwed up my graph here. Um, so if it's under five minutes, it costs about $4 to get an application. Six to fifteen minutes, about seven dollars and fifty cents, and it takes more than fifteen minutes, close to fourteen dollars an applicant. And the reason why I wanted to kind of put this in here was so often, you know, when I'm talking to recruiters and recruiting leaders, you know, they say, Listen, we know our online application process isn't optimized. We know that we've got, you know, um, you know, challenges in what we do. We just can't find the budget dollars to invest in either changing our technology platform or re-engineering what we do. What I hope is this slide, if you have an application process that, costs more, that takes more than 15 minutes, gives you the basis for a business case for you to say, you know what, if we go and we rethink our application process and we make it shorter, we make it easier for people to complete, we can reduce how much money we have to spend on recruitment media to get the same number of applicants. And in the process, we can pay for that re-engineering. And so, um, you know, this is something that hopefully is is a fairly valuable, you know, kind of, uh, you know, lens into how to cost justify some, you know, business process or technology change. But beyond the application length, you know, the biggest, 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 you know, kind of driver of of form friction um, is actually mobility. Um, you know, job by one of the reasons why job byte is has got such a great click to apply ratio and, and you know is in terms of allowing folks to apply is they've got a great off the shelf um, you know mobile platform that comes with their system. Um, for in general, across all applicant tracking systems, ninety eight percent of candidates abandon applications on a mobile. Percent, which only you know, on average two percent of people on a, on a mobile platform complete. Seven years ago, that may not have been a big deal. If you looked at the Google Analytics on your career sites, you know almost no one was going to career sites on their mobile device. Today, half of your mobile uh, of your job seeker traffic is on a mobile device. If you're buying traffic from somebody, whether it's Monster, Career Builder, D, Zip Recruiter, whoever, roughly half of the people that you're spending money on get to your career sites or your jobs are going to be on a mobile device. And there is a huge discrepancy between the conversions of people on a desktop and a mobile platform. And you know, there's, there's lots of reasons why. Um, there's lots of reasons why. Some of them are technological. You know, some applicant tracking systems, you know, they have two options for submitting your resume. Um, upload or copy and paste. If you're using an Apple iOS device, you can't save your resume onto your phone. It's physically impossible. And very few people you know, kind of will copy and paste on a mobile device. And so in those scenarios, it's, all, it's effectively a non-starter to apply for a job um, on those applicant tracking systems with an Apple iOS phone. You need to have the widgets, you know, upload from Dropbox, upload from uh, LinkedIn, upload from Gmail. Once you do that, you can actually see your apply rates on mobile phone almost double. Um, they're still not great, but they're better. But you know, more than that, we've kind of paved the goat path. We've taken an, an online application process that really started offline at the old-fashioned employment form that you would fill out when you went to the personnel department. That got moved online to you know, desktop browsers. And now we're taking exactly the same you know, 100-question form and trying to put it on a 2-inch by 3-inch screen with very, very poor effect. And so you know, another you know, kind of key thinking point here is to really start to – this is a, a very common thought um, in consumer product development these days – is mobile first. Is you design everything from the mobile perspective first. 
and then you back in to build in your desktop solutions. Because it's easy to go from a small screen to a bigger screen. It's very hard to go from a big screen to a small screen. And so this honestly has some to do with technology, but a lot of it has to do with how the data that we collect and how we collect it in the online application process. Rachel, I think it's back to you. Sounds great. Thank you um, for a lot of that great information. I think it helps folks really justify as they think about making improvements um, in their processes and also the reality of some of it does require some technology changes potentially for folks. Uh, we had a great question online that I thought I'd just answer back out to the broader group was the job byte database that we were sharing a lot of this funnel data is from does have the 50 million job seekers and the 10 million applicants, but this is based upon our entire customer base, which is not just the United States, that actually we have global customers all over the place. I will say a large percentage of it from a volume perspective is based in the U.S., but we actually were looking at some recent data that nearly 46% of all of those folks have some sort of a global component. Um, whether they are actually, we do have predominantly, of course, in the English languages, so of course Canada and the UK, um, and Australia is where we have a little bit more of a presence with our languages, but then that 46%, it could be a company that is you know, based in Virginia, but they happen to also have a job that's posted in Bangalore, for example. So uh, we actually are digging into more and more of that international information to understand how many of our customers are in certain countries versus they're recruiting in other countries, right, so we can keep meeting uh, the globalization of our workforces that are happening. So I just thought it was a great question. We answered it kind of privately, so we thought we'd just share it a little bit broader for everybody too. So. Uh, we're going to go to the candidate selection arena, um, and as many of you know, this is an important component as well um, as you're starting to work through. This final, uh, this statistic um, is that 80% of employee turnover can be attributed to a bad hiring decision. This comes out of a Harvard Business Review, and I think we've all been there, um, either as hiring managers or as recruiters where you know, later it's, just, it's crushing, right? It's one of those things that's just, it's kind of heartbreaking to be there when it does happen. Um, and so it's a great chance to really ask yourself as an organization, when you're getting to that final selection arena, you know, are we rushing to make a decision? Are we somehow settling with regards to what we're looking for? Are we compromising on anything? You know, what are we really focusing and emphasizing on, whether it's from a skills and capabilities and experience perspective or around a cultural fit? Um, and I think for those of us who've had these things kind of happen, it's a great reminder of this final stage of the funnel is still super important and really critical um, to having success in our, in our talent. Uh, so I'm thrilled. We're going to do equally um, a poll, which I love the interactiveness of this. It gives us a great perspective on uh, your guys' is what, you're, what you're finding and what you're doing in your own companies too. So this poll is what's the average job posting received, how many applicants? Um, and this is just, you know, what, what's your guess on it? Um, I think we've got 22 as an option, 59, 88, and 100. So um, I will equally let the responses start to come in here. Um, they're coming in fast, which is great. And you guys can see some of the poll results, I think, on the side, so. No, no, you, oh, you can't. <laughs> you can't see it. Never mind. Uh, we will show it to you, though, as soon as we get it. We've got over uh, almost 80 responses, um, so we'll get it to over 100 if that sounds great, um, and then we'll be able to show it and publicize for everybody. All right. We are over 100. Uh, we'll go ahead and say close the poll. I can clip that. Great. Oh, wow. Look at that. So what is the average job posting receives how many applicants? Your guys' vote was in the 59, almost 44% of folks were definitely in that area with everything split between the other, the other one splitting at about a third, a third as well. So um, we're going to actually, so fantastic. Uh, let me click through to the next slide. Actually, you guys are right on. So uh, impressive. Um, one job posting does tend to have about 59 applicants. Um, and I made reference to this a little bit earlier today. You know, really job boards and career sites continue to be the very big predominance of this. Um, there are, of course, the other arenas as well. From a, from a number of postings perspective, it's a very big part of the industry still. Uh, of course, you know, narrowing all of that down tends to be about four to six interviews for serious candidates. And so the work that you're able to do in your organization to take that 59 down to the four to six that actually get interviews uh, is an important component. 
There's, some, uh, there's all kinds of tools and techniques and best practices that companies use. Um, we happen to use actually video screening pretty prevalent, particularly for our customer success organization here at Jobvite. It is one of our features in our product that we, of course, use ourselves. There's also all kinds of technical screening if folks have um, wanted, wanted to do you know, technical partnerships with folks on that arena. Um, so it's, just a, you know, it's a great thing to think about. How do you in, take that 59 really to the 4 or 6 in where you're going? This, of course, leads to um, kind of the, the last, almost the second to the last on the final benchmarks. That active candidates to interview is that 15% of interviews actually lead to an offer. Um, so in that component, and as you know, you know that that process can be phone screens and video screens to technical competency tests to first rounds to second rounds, right? Um, and throughout that entire component, your candidates are having an experience with you as well as you're really trying to hone in on what's going to be the best hire and the best match for the company as well as for that person. So then we love to kind of get to the end of completing that recruiting funnel. So we're just going to show an overview here. Um, when we talk through the recruiting funnel, um, there's lots of different pieces in there. And so I'm going to ask Chris to kind of pop in, in here and, and talk with us a bit, and then we're going to um, wrap up a couple components and go from there. So. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I don't have a huge amount to kind of lay over this slide or the next, except for the fact that um, I've got gray hair. I'm 45 years old. I've been in the recruiting and recruiting technology space for, you know, a couple decades now. And what I love about, you know, this slide and, and the next one is just the specificity that you have. Um, you know, I've looked at a lot of this type of data, and it is very hard to get these types of benchmarks, um, you know, publicly shared. So I, ju I just want to say, you know, Rachel, thanks for sharing these because, you know, this is even though this is, you know, a broad mix and a broad generalization, um, you know, there's a lot of good benchmarking information especially on this page where you get to see you know, the company size and then you know, the average number of, of applicants per requisition all the way down to you know, what percentage of folks actually get hired and how long it takes. The thing that I found really interesting in this data though was that smaller companies interview more people um, and there's almost a precisely offsetting you know, percentage in the interview to offer ratio. And you know the, the the thing that I started to think about was why would that happen? So if you look at the the application center, fourteen percent of applicants get an interview with companies that are two hundred and fifty people or less. Well, if you start to get into the you know to the larger companies, it's nine percent. I mean that's a material difference. That's more than fifty percent different. And so you know the thing that I started to think about was companies with five thousand plus people have professional talent acquisition folks on staff. And you know they're doing their job. They are you know basically you know screening more effectively. They understand what to look for, and they're driving a you know kind of a, I think what you see in the data is a better optimized process. Um, and you know trying to save their hiring managers time and um, you know kind of bring some efficiency to it. So you know the the, the primary talk over here is. Everybody should be screenshotting this page and asking Sarah for a copy of the slides because this is awesome benchmark data to use back in your own, you know, kind of office to figure out how you're doing against, you know, a broad industry scope. Rachel, sounds great. Um, so we're actually going to talk about next steps. Um, so we've shared with you a tremendous amount of kind of data and insights, both from kind of AppCast and JobVite and just what we're seeing uh, in the industry. So what we've encouraged is let's take a look at kind of some of the next steps that we encourage folks to think about. The first one is, you know, really establish your goals, right? Um, it's important to really think about what is most important for what you want to achieve. Um, as you can imagine, there's lots of different pieces of the funnel, and so tackling it all at once may not be, you know, the, the most uh, effective or efficient for you. We all know we only have so much time and energy and dollars in our budgets, and so really thinking about what's the most important thing you want to achieve. Um, is it having more applicants at the very top? Is it actually having kind of that a candidate experience and then assessment numbers improve? Um, or do you want to have a higher acceptance rate with regards to your offers? You know, that really trying to hone in on what is the goal that you're wanting to establish um, will be important that will really also feed some other areas that you might tweak just a little bit, but focus on what your goals are and what's most important for you and your company. And Chris, you want to step us through kind of measuring, of course? 
Yeah, you know, and, and again, I, I don't mean to, to, to make this as sound so incredibly simple. Um, you know, when I'm not working in technology, I live on a little farm, and, you know, more often than not, the common sense solution is the right one. Um, the most important thing that you need to do is what Rachel said, establish the, your goals. What are your objectives? Once you've established your objectives, the key thing is to choose two or three things that you're going to measure consistently the same way day in and day out to evaluate your progress. And so, you know, I, I don't really stand on, on a, a, a soapbox and say you need to measure these seven things across the board. If somebody pushed me, I could probably tell you what I would do. But the most important thing is, is to relate your goals to the measurements that you're using to evaluate your progress and, and, and ensure that you don't change them. This happens more often than not whenever I go into an organization is you measure one thing for three months and then all of a sudden somebody thinks that they've got a better, cooler way of doing it. So you stop measuring it that way and you start measuring it a new way. And then three months later, you know, it's the, the vanity metric of the month and all of a sudden it changes again. So be consistent, be precise, keep it, you know, keep it clean and keep it small. And then I think this last thing, Rachel, I, I, I think that, um, you know, the, there's uh, kind of in, in the valley and if you build software, um, there's something about eating your own dog food. And if, you know, you read anything about talent acquisition today, you, you, you're going to be reading about, you know, the candidate's experience and how important it is, is to, to treat candidates like consumers. To do that, yeah, you I, have to walk in their shoes. You have to walk in their shoes. And, and in whatever way possible that you can do that, you should be doing it. I think it's a great call out. I started to coin it here as like drink our own champagne <laughs> because, uh, you know, and as I've been new to JobVite, um, it's been great to really kind of, you know, I have recruiters that are very uh, connected with our product. Um, and I've kind of had a little bit of a newer lens to bring to the team and say, what about this, right? And so really being able to like, you know, as we talked through like you guys polled how many minutes does it take to do your application? Like, how long does it really take? What does it look like? What does it feel like? And so if you were in those person's shoes, what would you want to be doing a little bit differently? And tie back to your goals. Like what is it you're wanting to look at, right? Um, I think at this point we're going to start opening it up for questions, right? Um, we've had some great questions online as well, and we've tried to answer them a little more broadly with everybody. But I'm going to hand it off to Claire, and uh, hopefully you guys will have some questions for Chris and myself. Perfect. Yes, yeah, so we do have some questions. Um, so I will start to ask those out to Rachel and Chris. One question that has been coming in is, are you guys getting the recording and are you getting the slides? And the answer to both is yes. So we'll be sending out both of those to everyone on the presentation and as well as everyone who registered. If you have any coworkers that registered and weren't able to make it, they'll be getting a copy of that as well. Uh, so don't worry on that. So for the first question, uh, Sylvia asked, do you have any data on where job seekers start their search? And specifically, what percentage start online versus offline in traditional methods of, of job search? That's a, 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 Rachel, if you don't mind, that's, that's a great question. Um, you know, the, there, there's been a tremendous amount of research done on, on that particular subject. I don't, I, I'm, you know, again, uh, gray hair, four kids, too many hours in planes lately. So I don't have it at the, at the top of, of my mind. But the key thing, though, that I, I do want to communicate to, to folks is that people interact uh, you know, in job search the same way they interact when they're buying a product or doing research. Online, the vast majority of job search starts with Google. Absolutely. You know, if you want to talk about where the most number of job searches occur online, it's somebody going to you know, the Google search box and typing in three things, the word job or jobs, a location, and a title that they're interested in. And from there, they start to navigate. 
Yeah, the only other thing I would add is, you know, this is actually something that happens, you know, Claire and I were talking about this. It happens in marketing as well as even in online in recruiting, right? Um, you have lots of different channels and avenues that, that customer or prospects are coming to you at. Same thing with candidates, right? You might actually have a possible candidate that met you at a job fair but didn't necessarily, you know, log in or register or something, but then maybe later decide, like, oh, let me go check out this company online. And so they might show up in that online application arena, but their actual first touch point might have actually been an event that you did. Um, and so I think what's important is like at least start to track what you can track, um, and then you may be able to dig in more qualitatively from that um, on any touch points that kind of eventually led somewhere. Um, but I think it's, you know, just start with what you can start to measure and look at, and then from there you can kind of use to get some anecdotal quality things of other things that are feeding those online versus offline um, experiences that happen in looking at candidates. So Great answers. Agreed. Definitely something we deal with in marketing a whole <laughs> lot. Um, so we do have a question from Suzanne. How do you determine how many recruiters recruiters are needed per comp or for your company size? So uh, Chris, if you're okay, I'd love to I'd love to stab, a tab, a, take a stab at this one. Um, we've been talking yep. about this a couple times here, even uh, at Job Bite. So uh, to me, my answer is it always depends on how much recruiting you're doing and what type of recruiting you're doing, right? Um, and we see this with our customers as well. Like we have, you know, some large enterprise customers. We have small business customers as well. And it really determines their usage of our product is very much determined by how much recruiting that they're doing, not necessarily the size of their employee population. Um, and so it really gets into how many, how many recs do you think you're going to have? Are you adding headcount? What's your turnover looking like? Um, I just did this for my own budget here at Jobbyte here with my team. And, you know, yes, there are some, you know, there's some information out there from a benchmarking perspective with regards to how many recs do recruiters, yeah, on average, how long does it take them to fill it? How long, um, how many do they get to done in the year? I will say then I actually applied more of my job bite history. Uh, because that's a predictor for me of success for the future, right? Um, and the, the number of recruiters needed per rec on my technology side was definitely different than on my sales and my GNA side. And so trying to look at all of those components to come up with what's the right mix that you're going to need. Um, and then you may have it by quarter, too. You may have a spike in Q1 and Q2 because your budgets have got all approved, right? You may have attrition that tends to happen in Q3, and so then you have a spike of needs in Q4. So. Um, it, it, I, I know you probably hate to hear, well, it depends. It depends on how much recruiting you're needing to do and where you want to focus and double down in that arena. So I hope that helps a little bit, uh, Suzanne. Yeah, Rich, I, just, just to add on top of that, I think you, you nailed it. It really does come down to the, to, to the corpus of requisitions a recruiter has and, and the market that you're operating in. I mean, when I was at the right thing, you know, we were the largest recruitment outsource. 200 clients. You know, I would look at rec loads across all those clients, both for the recruiters that were at the right thing as well as on staff. And, you know, there, there were, if you throw out executive search, um, you know, which is, you know, true executive search, which always goofs stuff up, you know, you, you could have a recruiter that's redlined with 10 requisitions. And I kid you not, you can have a recruiter that could handle more requisitions with 100 requisitions. It all depends on the job. It depends on the work recruiting workflow, and it depends on what needs, you know, what needs to happen. And so, um, you know, if you're looking for a broad-based average that means absolutely nothing because, you know, it doesn't take into account anything, um, you know, 20 to 25 requisitions, if you, you know, did a true straight average is probably where, you know, folks are at these days, um, you know, active requisitions on a recruiter's desk. But I, I think that that's, probably even, you know, too gross to, to, to be valuable in any way, shape, or form. I think those are all really good points about the different jobs as well as your recruiting workflow that can determine productivity of being able to look at that ratio. Um, the other one is, you know, I mean, I was at Apple and Intuit. Talk about two brand name companies. Like, you were able to fill the top of that funnel pretty fast and pretty quickly. Now, filtering through the funnel was what took work. Um, you know, for us here at Jobvite, we're really thrilled to have a good brand and reputation, particularly in the HR field. Uh, but when we start looking for, you know, iOS engineers, they're kind of like, oh, what do you guys, who are you guys, right? And so, depending upon also the size and the brand awareness of your company, that may also uh, determine a little bit of the ratio you start to look at for success for hiring. Um, if anyone has any questions for Rachel and Chris, we are 
looking at the end of our questions, you'll get at the front of the line. Type those into the chat box. Um, I do have a question for Chris. On the statistics that you showed on, you know, shortening the, the time to apply and shortening your application, do you have any tips for the people on the line on how you evaluate that? I know we get a lot of a lot of pushback on I need my application to be that long. What what do you say in those cases? Yeah, so so there, there's I guess I say three things. Um, the the first thing is um, you should go through on a an annual basis. Um, you know, kind of like spring cleaning. You should literally print out each page of of your application process, and you should bring together all the key stakeholders and make sure that every single question is required. It's, it's remarkable when you do that how frequently people say, yeah, I forget why we're asking that. And if somebody, the other part of it is, is if somebody says, yes, I need that, this is, you know, you've got to ask them why. <laughs> Have you, you know, in the medical profession they talk about, you know, getting information from a test and whether or not it changes management. So you know, if you go to your doctor and the doctor says, "I'm going to get an, an MRI on you," you know, say, "Doc, if you get the MRI and it's going to cost two grand, what are you going to do different because you got that?" And if they can't answer the question why, maybe you don't get the MRI. It's the same thing with asking a question. So the first part is once a year, go through the process, get everyone who's got a stakeholder around the table, make sure that you're asking required questions, and if and if only one person around the table says, "Yeah, we need that." Make sure that you drill down to make sure that it's required. Second thing is, is that more often than not, people say we need to ask that because of legal. One of my pet peeves. Get legal in the room and explain, get them to explain why you have to ask something. You know, yeah, you got to do your EEO stuff. But more often than not, I have gone through application after application where, you know, there's a goofball question in there or Ten of them, and somebody says, "Well, that legal requires us to ask this." Okay, you get legal in the room. And say, "Yeah, it's good for us to ask it. Why do we need to?" Well, we, we need to. Well, why? Is it is it is it statutory? Is it legal? Like, does the state of California require us to ask this? You know, and ninety seven percent of the time, there's no good answer. It's because you've got somebody in your legal department who thinks it's it's the good idea. Fairy, they think it's a good idea, but again, it doesn't change management. And then the third thing is, this is kind of a soul searching issue, and that is thinking about how you want to collect information from your job seekers. Right now what we in essence do is we ask them the vast majority of all the information we would ever need up front. That's incredibly inefficient because you know, the reality is that we're not in, recruiters aren't really in the hiring business, they're in the saying no business. right? 100 people apply, you say no to 99, you say yes to one. So for those 99 folks, do we really need them all to take an online assessment when they're applying? Or should we just be giving the online assessment to the three to five people that make it through the phone screen? Do we need to be asking them for their 10 years of work history, the 99 of them? Or do we just need to do that with the two people that make it to the hiring manager's desk? So the third part of this is just kind of staring at your navel and thinking about what we really need and when. And between those three things, um, more often than not, the answer about how long your application um, you know, needs to be comes out of the mist. We had one question. I brought up the, the charts from AppCast data, again, just for some visual cues. Um, and Chris mentioned this while he's going over it the first time. But there's just some symbol mix-ups mix, mix where this is supposed to be $4, $7.50, and $13.85 for those numbers. They're not percentages, so just to clear that up. We do have a question. Uh, how do you think one can make companies more comfortable with new ways of recruiting like online platforms? Simple question, right? <laughs> Open it up, um, Chris. I'd love your expertise on this one as well. Um, you know, talk. About, welcome to change management, right? You probably are seeing an opportunity or company 
Um, and so my simple answer usually tends to be like, can you articulate and show to them what the current kind of processes that happen, both from a candidate perspective as well as from kind of a recruiter and hiring manager perspective? Um, because if you're trying to do change management inside the company, your hiring managers probably know what their view looks like, but they may not understand what it's like from the recruiter perspective or from the candidate perspective. So try to show them what current state is and then bring in um, what you think are kind of comparable either data points or benchmarkings to show them like best in class so that then you could show a delta of where you see the opportunity to improve. Uh, because for some companies it may be moving to an online platform. For others it may be you know, because something completely different that they're wanting to change in their processes. So really try to show them the current state as well as some potential future ideal state um, and then be able to show it to them from the multiple different participants that are in the process of your candidates, your hiring managers, and your recruiters, for example. So I know it's a very broad answer, but I hope that might guide you a little bit in the direction of where you're trying to go. So I don't know, Chris, if you had any uh, advice on that, on that great question. No, no, I, I, I think that's basically it. I mean, um, the, the key is to do a pain point analysis. You know, if, you, if you're doing any hiring whatsoever and you don't have a technology that enables you to do it, there is a cost and a pain to your organization. Characterize it. And when you can characterize a pain and a problem, um, it gives you the opportunity to talk about solutions. Again, you know, I don't mean to be a farmer here, but it's, it's, it's pretty much that simple. A literal farmer for anyone who missed that. Literal farmer. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> so with that, we are a little bit past the top of the hour, so I hope everyone on the call, thank you very much for joining, um, and I hope this presentation was helpful to you. Once again, everyone is going to get the deck, everyone's going to get the recording, and, um, and with that, thank you to Rachel, thank you to Chris and AppCast as a whole. You guys have been wonderful. And uh, have a great day, everyone. Thanks, everybody. Day. Happy Thursday. Bye. <laughs>